it was working at one of the coolest companies in the world in the coolest city in the world. And, and that was an absolute dream come true. I started hosting these intimate dinners and over time and over three years of consistently hosting, they've grown from eight person dinners to 2000 person tech parties. I've done them in six different cities. I've done over a hundred of them. 15,000 people have attended. Attendees include, you know, the co-founder of billion dollar companies, chief product officers of hundred billion dollar companies. Everybody always talks about the amazing things. What are some of the hard times that you've had with this? Like what are maybe some of the struggles or maybe a story that something went wrong? I think that's always interesting for people to hear. Welcome to the Virtual Ventures Podcast, episode 20. I'm your host, Andres Sanchez, and this week's guest is Andrew Young, a tech and events visionary. As the owner of Andrew's Mixers, he hosts and curates tech parties for industry leaders. He is also a global product lead at Google and has been featured in Bloomberg, Fortune, and Fast Company. Get ready for an inspiring conversation as we explore tech, events, and more with Andrew Young. Make sure to help the podcast continue to grow and like, comment, and subscribe. Andrew, thanks for coming on the show, my man. Really excited to have you. How are you doing today? Good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm excited to do this on a, on a Saturday morning. It's going to be fun. Yeah, for sure. I like the weekend episodes a little better because I don't have to worry about actual work. So I feel like I can prepare really well and like I'm much more fresh. So excited that you got one of these weekend slots. It's not a popular demand pick. Mm. So I'm always excited when I see somebody grab it. If you've listened to us before, and I know the listeners listening now know, I go right into things. Who is Andrew? Let's hear a little bit about your story and how you got to where you're at right now. Yeah, so um, I'm Andrew Young. I'm a you know full time. I'm a, a tech operator, so I, I work at Google. I'm a global product lead there. Before that, I worked at I worked at Meta. I was a North uh, North America operations lead, and then before that, I worked at a few other companies. That's a uh, you know that's what I like to say. That's my day job, but I also have a night job, which is you know long story short, throwing parties for people in tech. <laughs> And um, that all started when I moved to New York City three years ago, knowing very few people in the middle of pandemic, you know, August 2020, everything was shut down. So I started hosting and, you know, like I said, I didn't really know anyone. So I started meeting people online on Twitter, LinkedIn, Fishbowl, all these online platforms, bringing people together, hosting these dinners, these intimate dinners. And over time and over you know, three years of consistently hosting, they've grown from eight person dinners to 2000 person you know, tech parties. Wow. Um, I've done them in six different cities. I've done over a hundred of them. 15,000 people have attended. Attendees include, you know, the co-founder of billion dollar companies, chief product officers of, of hundred billion dollar companies. And, you know, I, I, I use that network to help f founders hire talent, fundraise. So it's a bit of a community. It's a bit of a tech ecosystem with an events layer, which is which, what I call unique experiences for the most remarkable people in tech. And so, yeah, just a little bit about me. I do a few other things as well, but those those are the main things, the Google and the, and the events thing. That's amazing. What cities have you been and do you plan on coming to Miami if you already, if you haven't already? And then how do I punch my ticket into one of these awesome events? Yeah, so I've, I've been in um, six different cities. I've done New York City, obviously that's home base for me. I've done Toronto. I lived there for seven years, so I visit pretty often. Done Miami. I've done, I think, three events in Miami. Miami, awesome. um, Far Basel, and and I think right after Summit, and I've done LA, San Francisco, and there's one more there that I can't think of. Austin, Austin, Austin. That was, was going to be my guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All all the big sort of like hubs. Yep. Awesome. So like, what are kind of the requirements to get into these events? I know you said you started at eight person intimate dinners, they've grown now to 2000 people events. Is it limited to get in? Do you have to have certain credentials to be part of the guest list? Like, how does that work? So I have events that are broadly available to, to accessible to anyone. So in Austin, I did a South by Southwest like kickoff party and like 2000 people were there and I don't, I don't really gate it, but it tends to be a tech founder investor operator crowd. And so I think like 40% of them are entrepreneurs and founders. The big ones, again, I, I don't like gate anyone's welcome. I've actually never charged a dime at any of my events. I love um, that. And at the smaller ones, for example, I run the series called the Junto Club. I run it every month in New York City and it's a hundred people max and there's a waitlist 
list of about 4,000 people. And so that one is is a lot more curated where it's, um, I, I sort of look for the, the remarkable and, and brilliant people who seem to be awesome humans and seem to be kind. And the application process takes like five minutes. So I, I, I literally read through every single one and I'm like, who would benefit by being in this room and how could they add value to others? So it's a bit of a, um, more of an art than a science in terms of curation. But typically that, you know, these founders have like either built, built business that, that have like a million dollars in revenue or have like, you know, 50 employees. And, and it tends to be sort of that kind of crowd. When did you realize that you had this skill? Like this is not a very unique type of thing to kind of work your way into. And it seems like you're doing an amazing job. Like when did you realize that this was a talent of yours? Yeah. And thank you for that. Yeah. So a bit about my background, you know, I've lived in five different countries. I spent 20 years in Asia. I was born in Hong Kong. I moved to Taiwan and moved to Shanghai, I moved to Canada and I moved to New York City. And so moving around, you know, I'm 27 years old, um, five times in 27 years. That's, you know, whatever the math is, it's a few years per, per country. Yep. And it takes more than that to build your community, build your network. And so every time I moved, I had to uproot my life and rebuild my community and my friends and my professional network from scratch. And, you know, it was a, it was a lonely childhood, uh, you know, because, you know, single child and, and every time you moved, you had to make new friends. And so I learned really quickly how to make friends fast. And I am, I, you know, I feel for those who are in that situation of, of you know, they're lonely or they don't have a network. And, and that was a lot of people during during COVID, right? Because no one could leave their apartment and it was dangerous and, and that kind of thing. And so I, you know, one, I got really good at that and bringing people together and building my own network and teaching others how to build theirs. And then second of all, I really just feel for those out there who don't have the ability or don't have the infrastructure to do that. And so I've dedicated a big portion of my time to helping others, you know, connect with other people. That's awesome. And it's always great when something comes like deep rooted from a personal situation or a personal experience, because I feel like that's when you really give it 150% like this means more to you than just a status or title. And I think that's really important because you're in New York, so you get it. I live in Miami. There's plenty of people that do things for the status and the recognition, not for the right reasons. And it really seems like you're doing all this for all of the right reasons. So one, kudos to you for that because it's an amazing accomplishment. And it's not something to just glaze over either. I mean, the fact that you've been able to move to all of these different countries and then continue to, like you said, uproot yourself and build a network from scratch scratch like that shows something that's not a simple task and we throw around this word networking so loosely now and it is not easy there's a difference between networking and just talking to a hundred different people like if you're not getting results from those initial meetings, those elevator pitches, those first 30 seconds, are you really networking? Or are you just talking to a bunch of cool people? And it seems like you've done such a good job of not only meeting all these cool people, but keeping them close, keeping them in a community, and then helping others like myself who works in tech, like going to an event like yours. I work at a big tech company like we talked about before the episode, but honestly, my passions are in the startup world. I was a founder of a few companies in college. This is kind of my newest venture. And my goal is always to end up at startups and bounce around and enjoy that life. Like you telling me the guest list and the pedigree of people coming to these events gets me fired up to like want to go and show up and be part of that community. So a little rant there about you like that. This is an amazing accomplishment. And I'm so excited Thank to like continue to dissect this and see where it's all really come from. So great yeah. job from there. Let's pull back all the way to your job at Meta, your product lead at Google. Like how has that been working in big tech? Yeah. So the, you know, I was in Toronto. I lived in Toronto for seven years and um, I, I left Toronto in 2020 to go to New York City. Probably one of the worst times to do, do, to do that. <laughs> Arguably maybe a good time. It was uh, a good time I, from Canada. From Canada. Yeah. And, and so I worked for this company called Bell. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a telephone company or uh, sort of like a Verizon for Canada. And you know, it's it's rare for, for someone to go from um, like a Bell to like a Facebook. You know, Facebook really only hires from like top schools, top top consulting firms, like a lot of people exit from McKinsey and, and Bain and that kind of thing. And so the, the pivot is quite hard. And it was uh, all just through, you know, what you call networking and, and reaching out to like hundreds of people and then speaking with them and, and building relationships and that kind of thing and, and mastering the interview process. So when I, when I landed at Facebook, it was a dream come true. It was working at one of the coolest companies in the world in the coolest city in the world. And, and that was an absolute dream come true. So I, I really enjoyed my experience there. I, you know, I attribute so much of who I am and what I learned to my experience at Facebook. And and before Facebook, honestly, I was like still quite shy. I didn't know how to present to executives. I didn't know how to build relationships. I didn't know how to put a 
PowerPoint presentation together. And it was, it was honestly Facebook and Meta that taught me all that stuff. And it taught me the power of influence and, and how to influence people and which, which I've taken for, you know, for my, my sort of my hustle outside my job. Google sort of an extension of that where it's, it's very similar. It's almost like the same company. It's twice as large, but it's very similar culture, workflows, incentives, how you get promoted is probably the same exact way. And so, you know, Google for me was so from like my first company to, to Facebook, it was like the learning was like exponential and it was, it was insane. I was in constantly in, in, in discomfort in, in a good way, you know, in, in terms of learning. And then Google sort of like, you know, might be like honestly flattening out a little bit because it's like the same thing. And, and, and I've just realized that all these companies, uh, you know, you work at a tech company, they're probably all the same. Yeah. And uh, tech playbook. Yeah. Same playbook, same way they manage their, their structures and their organizations. And so, yeah, it, it's been a good time. I learned a lot, but I think you can only spend, um, if, if you're someone that seeks discomfort and, and growth at, at an exponential level and that you seek that intensity, you can only really do these for like three to five years. And then you, you have to, you know, you really need a big change. It could be another role in the organization or different organization, but it definitely flattens out after a certain time. What are next steps for you? Do you want to continue to work in big tech? Are you looking to go from Google to the next big, exciting company? Or do you think this is something that's going to phase out and you're going to go in the entrepreneurial route and run these events as like the main thing that you do? I'm exploring that right now. I um, I wouldn't go to another big tech. I wouldn't go to another company with more than 50 employees. I've just, okay. you know, I advise startups on the side. I've worked, I work with a lot of these companies that are, you know, SMBs and you know they, they operate a little bit differently but I, I think I've just I've done so much of in the space already and so I, I want to explore something new which is most likely entrepreneurship you know part of it as being a creator an entrepreneur and not necessarily building something that's venture backed but just trying my my own thing for a bit so so yeah that's really vague but I'm exploring taking like the assets I have which is the events the newsletter the the network and then and then figuring out like how can I add value to these people and, and sort of make a business model out of it so that that's what it probably looks like yeah I mean it seems like you have all of the right resources to get into the entrepreneurial world or like you said jump into a SMB with 50 or less employees which that is also in itself almost entrepreneurship I mean when it's a small team like that you're so ingrained you might not be technically starting the company and have the risk that the founders do but you're right there in the trenches with them and that's a good way to really like get a feeler on can I do this or do I want to do this? Because something that I talk about with my friends all the time, like I, like I said, started a few companies in college, thought I was going to never work for anybody. And then I realized business is really hard and things can change in an instance. So I learned so much at that point. But people, I think we've lost the concept of like how hard business is. Everybody thinks like if you go on Twitter and you go on Instagram, it's like, yeah, start up a solopreneurship, get clients at 3,500 a month and get five of them and you'll be a millionaire. But and like, like, I just don't think people get how hard that is. And it's easy to get a client, but good luck retaining them for a long period of time unless you have a crazy good offer. So I think it's interesting. And I, I wish more people were interested in taking the leap. Not you don't always have to go start a company like go work at a startup, not a startup. And for people not listening on video, I'm doing air quotes here, not a startup, like not a company with 4500 employees, like go work for a company with 50 or less employees. And you'll really see if one you have the drive and the determination to do it because not everybody does. And that's not a bad thing. Like not everybody was built to go start a company like this is not a simple task to accomplish. So I love that you're willing to explore that thinking about doing something like and I think somebody of your status at these bigger tech companies would be such an asset to these smaller companies who need somebody who knows what culture is need somebody who knows how to deliver like you said a presentation a message and help the people around them get better. So I love that. Let's talk about the newsletter. Newsletters are super popular. Now I just started a newsletter. I've got 21 subscribers in my first three weeks. Nice. Let's go. But it is a really tight knit community. Like I have those 21 subscribers because I tweeted and shout out Beehive, not sponsored, but that's the platform I'm using. I tweeted something about Beehive and the tweet got like 8,000 impressions, 40 people commented under and a ton of people started subscribing to the newsletter and like collaborating. So that was really like exciting from my perspective. I was like, wow, like it's always nice to jump into a community with the like minded people. So how has your experience been creating a newsletter and now being like an author of one with a lot of subscribers? Yeah, so I, I started, you know, I'll sort of rewind back a little bit. I got my job at Facebook from reaching out to hundreds of people and speaking with hundreds of people and getting their advice and and just you know like building relationships with them once i got that job i felt like i owed it to the community to to pay it forward 
And so I opened up my calendar for months, close to a year. And I was like, any student, any early career professional who's looking for a job in tech, and it was a tough time, it was COVID 2020, you know, there was like layoffs and that kind of thing, poor job market. I was like, book time with me and I will give you my time. I'll answer any questions you have with full transparency. And I, I spoke with probably hundreds of students and early career professionals. And I found myself saying the same things over and over again, sort of this evergreen, you know, insight and, and wisdom. Yeah, I found myself saying the same thing over and again. And I'm like, why not just like scale that and and write write about it? So I started writing on LinkedIn, and then this was when I think Substack came out, and I was like, this is this is hot, this is catching on. Like everyone's on Substack. I'm like, there's something yep. to it, and uh, I kind of want to own an email list because you know I, I had an audience on, on LinkedIn, but uh, it it wasn't mine. You know, it's at mercy of the algorithm of LinkedIn. So I was like, I kind of want my own thing, which is email lists and newsletters. So I started writing a Substack and actually messaged every single person I, I helped, and I was like, hey, like we had a 30 minute chat a few weeks back. If it was helpful, here's my newsletter where I'm going to share similar insights. And that's where I learned the concept of like the funnel. And I think when I launched that newsletter, I immediately had a couple hundred subscribers who were the people uh -huh. around me that I I'd previously helped or were invested in my journey. So I had a bit of a kickstart to it. And I started writing and, and writing and writing. And um, in two years, I think I got to, got it to like about 15,000. And then I started integrating like my events in there. Thank you. I started integrating my, my events in there. And so now it's the place where you stay in touch with me, attend my events. And it, now it's at 21,000. Oh. But it, it's still a little bit like, it, you know, m most, most uh, newsletters or to educate or to entertain or to inform. And mine has been all over the place where it's like, here's my events, but here's my wisdom. So I'm trying to find a way to consolidate it and to make it a little bit more specific just because it is, it, it's more of, I could never like sell it or anything. Um, it's just more so something that's attached to my personal brand, which is a little bit all over the place. But it, yeah, it's been a great experience lear uh, learning how to write and, and market. And I think with improving your writing, you improve the way you think and the way you sort of problem solve. So it's it's a really useful skill that I've, I've really enjoyed learning. That's awesome. Two things I want to unpack from that that is one amazing that you were willing to put yourself out there and help others. I am actually, I'm finding a lot of similarities between us as we continue to talk here, but I'm just like that. The job that I got, it was a special program within the company. It's their early in career program. And they picked 50 of us and there was 41,000 applicants for the role. So really tough to get this job. And that's when I realized I'm like, all right, maybe I, I do have some of these skills. Like I'm a great interviewer. I'm great at talking. I've had some pretty unique experiences in college. So my goal is always to do something like what you did. Like I wanted to open my calendar up and just help people for free because one, I love meeting people. And two, I really get joy from mentorship and helping like I want to be a leader going forward within my company and companies that I joined going forward. So I'd love to pick your brain a little bit about how you found all of those people that wanted to like take those free meetings, because that's something I would love to do and love to help out. Because I mean, I help a lot of my friends because the job landscape is tough. Like everybody's kind of at the same level almost at this point. Like everybody's going to good schools. Everybody's getting their four year degree. Everybody's going back and getting their master's like things are it's tough. It's not just go get your degree and then snap your fingers and get a good job. Like you've really Really got to compete in these interviews. So that's just something I wanted to highlight. And that's something maybe we could talk offline because I love that sure. idea. And then two, just got my brain thinking here. What if you did like a segment in that newsletter where you kept the newsletter as like your events and that's where you broadcasted to people, but you were able to do maybe like a weekly because you still like to help people out find these jobs. What if you did like a weekly five minute video that came out with your newsletter of just a tip of the week or like a suggestion mm. of the week to help people learn and maybe the video would help like separate it from the newsletter and keep it engaging super random thought just the first thing that popped in my head when you told me you wanted to try and like figure out a smooth way to do it i think that would be super cool to get like a five minute video from you on a tip of the week on an interview tip or on a outreach tip something like that so i like super, that. So, yeah i, like that. I can't yeah. turn my brain off like whenever i'm talking to people i'm always thinking of ideas thinking of like different ways to do certain things so if i didn't say it i would forget it and then i would be upset because i would know that i did have a good idea when we were talking and I didn't push forward with it. So that's a, it's a random thought there. And if you ever use it, let me know because I think that'd be super cool. Yeah, yeah, I like it. I, I've been experimenting with like TikTok and I have a few friends sort of helping me out who are like TikTok influencers. And um, yeah, I'm just, I'm trying to think of what content would resonate there. And there's a lot of stuff with like how to get a job and how to like do a good job in, you know, in a, in a big company or even like a, a startup. So yeah, there are a lot of like mental models and hacks there that I, I, I want to share. That's worked for me in the past. I'm just trying to think of like the angle so so it's a great idea it's a great idea i might end up using it yeah i think a good underutilized space right now is how to get the most out of your remote job mm. i think a lot of people are in remote jobs but 
are either a burning out because they're stuck at home and they're feeling like trapped. They don't get to interact with people face to face. And then two, I think a lot of people are getting these remote jobs and coasting and getting away with coasting. And then five years down the road, when they have to actually go get a real job, or maybe we all go back to the offices, they're going to be really overwhelmed when they haven't made any career growth or any personal growth over the next five years. And I, I forget where I saw, I think it might have been on the Callum Johnson show where he had interviewed somebody who had said this. And I thought about it because I mean, I work remote, but I also know I also started jobs online. So I knew what it was like to be at home, how you got to go get up, you got to walk around, you got to go do certain things. So I think that's like a space that no one really talks about. But there could be like a lot of potential. It's like how to get the most out of your remote job, how to go about it the right way. So I think that's like a super underutilized space and just the online education when it comes to jobs. So I think that's really cool. Mm. And we're going on a little bit of a tear here. Let's try and pull it back to the events. Like that's what I'm super interested in learning about. I saw you did a OK Boomer with Jason Calacan on This Week in Startups. Love that podcast. Love Jason. And I saw you've been featured in a few uh, articles like Forbes. How did that come about? How was that experience? Was that like a launching pad for your growth? Or were you already big when you started to get those types of things? Because those are not small accomplishments. Yeah, you know, I, I think at this point, I've, I've reached like 15,000 15, people in, in New York City have, have come to these events, uh, or like close to that number. And uh, the, the reach is beyond that just from Twitter, I think it's like millions of, of views. So by, you know, by extension, I have a ton of reporters coming to my events, like I think every single publication has been to my event before. And I see mm. this in, in my invite list. I'm like, whoa, tons it like Bloomberg like damn that's super cool I'd never met a reporter or an investor before I moved to New York City like there were there were some in, in Toronto but like not to the scale that New York has it and I and and so they they honestly just reached out and they were like we love what you're doing can we cover it and I started just being friends with them and building relationships with them and now I'm on more of an active push to get press and to get a bit of publicity because of a, of a very specific visa I'm trying to get and so I've I don't have Forbes I have fortune and um, oh, I, have fortune. Like, I have some other pieces coming out in the next few weeks so yeah that should be exciting. But um, I, I just want the press. I, I never really cared about publicity in the past. Like on Twitter, I'm a non on like Instagram, like my name's there, but like, I'm like, I don't really have pictures of my face or anything. So I'm making that shift to becoming more of a like a bit more of a public person, because I've realized like that's needed to, to build a brand into with where I'm headed. Like that's absolutely critical. In terms of like driving, you know, leads, I don't think the press actually did anything for in terms of driving attention to, to my events. It's more so when I pitch sponsors. And when I tell people about what I do, I'm like, like, hey, like I was featured in Fortune and you know these other magazines, and it just gives me a layer of legitimacy. Honestly, like that this week in startups pod, I didn't even know what it was. I thought it was just like some small pod. And my friend, like Rachel, uh, she's like, "Do you want to speak on this thing?" And I'm like, "Yeah, sure, whatever. It's gonna be fun." I, like I loved, I love podcasts in general. And then I saw that it got like almost 100k views, and everyone at the event was like, "Congrats!" I'm like, I'm "Like what? <laughs> like what is this thing?" And so that you know that was very flattering, but it was never an intentional push until like now. Awesome. And then one Forbes, if you're listening, get this guy on a magazine get this guy an article because i think everybody else is noticing that this is an awesome trend i think there's something special about these events like that i don't know if right now people are like noticing but it'd be really cool to look back like 10 years later and be able to say like you had your fingers in a ton of these relationships, a ton of these companies, because that's the cool thing about like people like you bring one A plus player to the table who could transform a company. Most likely that founder is not going to give you the credit and hopefully they would. But you changed a company's trajectory with an event and like what a cool job to be able to host fun parties and have them make these massive impacts to companies, individuals. And I mean, I'm just, I can't think of like a more fun thing to do. And maybe it's because I'm from Miami and I like partying and I like going out and I love the networking thing. So it just kind of fits perfectly into what I enjoy. But man, I can't think of like a more entertaining thing to do and be able to say like that. What a, what a cool thing to walk into a room and say like, oh, what do you do for a living? I throw tech parties. And it's like, oh, what is that? And it's like, oh no, a lot of people come to these things. A lot of C-suite level people. And like, yeah, it's just, uh, man, like I'm, I'm a little bit fangirl in here. Like it just seems like such a, it's some such a fun thing to do it's a lot of i always I yeah enjoy. i was like, yeah, it's a ton always of like yeah. <laughs> i always like to bring up like everybody always talks about the amazing things what are some of the hard times that you've had with this like what are maybe some of the struggles or maybe a story that something went wrong i think that's always 
interesting for people to hear because it's not always sunshine and rainbows when we're running these companies. Yeah. For anyone who's like hosted an event before, they know it's it's hard. It's a hard thing to do because one, it's expensive. There's a lot of infrastructure needs. You need money. You need a venue. You need people to come. There's a lot of dependencies. You know, you, you don't just need one thing to go right. You need probably like five things to go right that are all disconnected from each other. And then the second thing is there's a lot of logistics and it's a very deeply, you know, operational thing to do. Like the skills are operational. And so most people spend months just planning one event. I like very early on, like figured out like what the bottlenecks were and like try to automate as much as I could as possible. And so that's how I'm able to do like five a month. Um, I think if I really tried, I could probably do like 20 a month. Wow. But there's, I don't think there's any point uh, to doing 20 a month. But it's, you know, I've done over 100 events and, and honestly, it doesn't ever get any less stressful. Like there's a lot of planning <laughs> required. There's a lot of steps. There's a lot of people you have to speak with at every st- uh, part of the process. And I've tried to outsource a bit of that, but it's still like you show up to the event, you're like, what could go wrong? So much stuff. It could rain. I do a lot of my events at rooftops. It could rain. I'm surprised. You know, I've never been rained out on before, and I've done you know probably 30 rooftop events. And there's one. Don't do Wednesday. an event in Miami. Don't do an event in Miami over the summer because it, it rains just about every day. So I don't want I don't want you to lose your streak. Yeah, yeah, I'm nervous now because I'm knocking wood because I got one next Wednesday for a thousand people, and I'm like, I hope it doesn't rain. There's no indoor cover. You know, I have a venue uh, to back up just in case. But that's what I mean. You, you got to like lock up a backup venue I'm in a place like New York City where like everything is booked out all the time and it's not cheap. And yeah, it, you know, events is just a hard business, and there's a lot of like little hard things. But the hardest part is seeing live feedback. And so if you go to an event, imagine a hundred people, and you just see people walk in and leave, and they're like, this sucks. And I have to be there and endure that and stay till the end and see multiple people do that. So the live feedback is really discouraging and it's it's not even actionable. If someone just leaves and I never see them again and I see them un- unsubscribe, I'm like, there's literally nothing I can do there. So that's yep. that's the hardest part, live feedback. And how do you, because I agree that that's super tough to swallow sometimes because at the end of the day, like it's something you personally built, you personally put together, you put your brand behind. So how do you deal with something like that? I've come to terms that if you, let's use this example. If you walk into a room of 10 people, six of them won't care about you. Two of them will love you and two of them will hate you and that, that that's like the just the distribution you have in at, at scale in, in any scenario so i'm like at a thousand person event like there's going to be um maybe one or two hundred people that just hate it and it's just not for them and it's bad product fit and i just keep that heuristic in mind whenever something happens i'm like people are going to hate it but also people are going to love it and most people won't care and that that's helped me a lot there's always going to be haters out there you know what i've realized growing a bit on twitter is that there are like really strange hateful <laughs> and like weird people out there like i this guy like i don't know if it was guy but this random Twitter anon would comment on all my posts and just like insult me and, and the, my attendees and, and call us like nerds and stuff. And I'm like, first it was kind of funny, but then they kept doing it over and over and getting it was getting worse. And so I blocked it. And at first I was like, hey, like it's kind of funny, but like it's not funny anymore. Like it's it's getting old. Like, can you like do something else? Like, you know, I still you know, I back it, but do something more funny. And he's like, no. And then so I blocked him and he created a new account and continues to do that. I'm like, people can just be really weird. And I, I just don't understand what the intention there is at all. So I just realized like when you see people at scale like you realize like some people are really weird and just don't belong in the same room yeah i always wonder how some of those people because even i don't have a huge following and i still get people like that who come in and, and bother me and i'm just like man you'd be such a better person if you put this much effort towards something positive or like a job or, or something yeah, that is impactful to society like go do something and yeah i think it's just a part of the game so two things there were one what is like the end goal for these events like do you want an andrew young in every major city running these (laughs) events what is the goal to monetization like is it just going to be sponsors do you think you'll ever charge people to get in for more exclusive events let's get a little more into the business part yeah i'm still exploring what the you know i I understand the problem which is oftentimes especially in this world like really high accomplishing people ambitious people and, and also just good people find it hard to meet others in isolating cities like new york city and i was talking to someone who's been to like six of my events and they've met and i surveyed them or interviewed them and they they were like, I'm, I met 15 friends from your events that I continue to stay in touch with. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. I'm like, how would you meet these people before you went to my events? And they're like, oh, maybe like like alumni events that happens once a year or maybe like a wedding or through my personal network. But really, 
there's nowhere else. Like you don't sell a house and zero bond. They're not like communities. They're they're venues. You pay 240 bucks a month to get a cool venue, but nobody talks to each other. If you've yeah. been to a sew house, which I'm sure you have, nobody like talks to each other. So it's not a community. And so anyone who started off as a community has pivoted into quickly monetizing through food and beverage, which is like a zero bond and a sew house. I think majority of their money comes from like the actual hospitality business, not the community business. And any community that has been venture backed has scaled out of control and sort of ruined the elements that made them an amazing community in the first place. And so I think that's all up to the founder and, and the operator that's building that business and how much they care about the profit versus the, the people in the community. And obviously I'm not being like, I'm not starting a not-for-profit, but there's a balance there. And I think, you know, I've done this for two years, a hundred plus events, you know, a lot of people have done it really just for free. And I want to continue to, to be on that mission. And I think there are ways to make money that aren't ruining it for the attendees. And so sponsorships is one, you know, I see a media arm as part of another, you know, writing expands into maybe a pod like you, like maybe TikTok, like video, that kind of stuff. And then there's, there's probably, you know, I'm connected with all these GPs at these incredible funds and all these C-suite at like billion dollar companies. I'm like, maybe there's a fund play there or a platform play, which is just connecting people at the highest level. People, founders who are raising money, founders who are hiring talent, founders who are trying to find a fractional CFO, just providing that platform at scale to connect people and, and building a business model out of that. And then of course the, the events, which, you know, at one point I might start charging if it's a, you know, all-inclusive yacht party, I'm going to charge <laughs> you. Yeah. Um, it just depends what it is. And right, right now the offering is just, oh, you get a rooftop and you don't get a drink or anything, but it's free. And so as I improve the offering, I'll have to scale up, you know, how I sort of charge people or how, you know, what I need from the attendees to, to make the event possible. It's been really impressive just to watch you, like the amount of thought that you've put into all of this and the level of detail that you've put into even the smallest decisions. Like this is why I'm not charging. This is why I haven't scaled out to like a massive operation. And for anybody listening, this is really important, like at any level or at any business that you're doing, the quickest way to go down the wrong path is to start making impulse decisions or quick decisions, because you'd be surprised in business, something very small can have a massive effect on your results, on your image, on your branding. I love how just calculated you are. And like, we just met right now, but I'm, that's just what I'm feeling from the way that you've described everything. Very calculated, very mature, bigger picture. And you know what? I always struggle with people because I'm somebody who thinks way out in front, like, and that sometimes is a problem for me. Like I'm calculating things down to like six years from now, this is what I need to be doing. And this is how I'm going to get there. And it's great, but sometimes it's a little too much, but it's very important to have a wider view. Like so many people, especially now, it's just like, all I care about is what's in front of me right now and what's in front of me for the next week. And then it's like, when you back away and look and think about this decision I make right now, what does it set me up for in five months, not in five days? And it's like, oh, maybe it's not the right decision right now. Let me do this. And you find that you just, so many more doors have opened up when I shifted my mindset to that instead of like, this is great right now. Like I'm going to do it now. And it's like, all right, well doing that now was great for five days, but it just blocked me from these three or four things that I could have done five, six months from now. Just honestly, an absolutely amazing story. The way that you've built this up, the way that you've started from moving around a lot to grounding yourself in New York and immediately building a brand and community off it is extremely impressive. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Like I think there's so many nuggets that people will get from this interview that they can take and apply to anything that they're doing, which is extremely important. Something I always like to ask at the end of every episode, I would just like to take the conversation a little bit outside of business and see what's going on upstairs for you. And that's what are you excited about in the near future? You know, I think a big trend has been a new New York Times article that came out about loneliness and the loneliness epidemic. And everyone's, you know, Brian Chesky was talking about how his goal is to build, you know, Airbnb is about community, you know, at, at its very core, it's to bring people together through, you know, accessible housing and travel options. And so as a result of that trend, I've seen so many incredible startups, you know, get funded and sort of scale up their model around bringing people together, whether that is a social club or tech infrastructure, an app or tool. I'm excited to see where this goes because I think, and you know, this answer is is more business related, but I, I think the last two years have just been so hard. The last three years have been so hard on people and especially for new grads or people in a transitionary point of their lives who had to go through that remote first 
era, they're now struggling to build relationships or deeper connections. And the stats are out there, like one in five, that might just be male adults in the US don't think they have a close friend. And there's a huge wave that is, you know, it's not AI, it's not a tech wave, but it's it's a sort of a human, it's a core human truth wave, which is uh, we, we need a way to sort of bring ourselves together and, and gather and, and collaborate and, and gather to grow together. And I'm, I'm excited to see what happens. And I'm, I'm sort of building something. So I'm excited to see what I, what I do in the next six to eight months. I think it's like, it's going to be a turbulent time. And I've, you know, I got this whiteboard behind me. I just got it because my head is constantly spinning because I'm thinking about this thing and I can't, I was texting my founder friends at 2 a.m. last night because I just can't get off my mind. So I'm excited to see what I build to contribute to this trend, but also the overall wave that everyone is contributing to, I think is going to be a very pivotal point and impactful time in our society. One of the most impactful times in like in the last 10 years. So that's going to be really cool to watch and, and be a part of. Drop the mic right there. What a great answer. I am a huge advocate for community. My companies that I had built previously were built all on communities. I have said it on multiple podcasts. I think that customer service departments are going to be um, irrelevant and it's going to be just communities and customers advocating for the brand and that's going to be enough. So I think this is a great shift. I think you're at the tip of the spear right now, headed in the right direction. That whiteboard is super cool, by the way. Um, <laughs> I might ask you after where you got that because I'm looking yeah. to add something like that for myself because I agree. It's two, three in the morning and my brain's working like it's 12 in the afternoon and I just had my second cup of coffee. So Andrew, where can people find you? Where can people connect with you? I always write really awesome descriptions. I got to <laughs> cater to the lazy people that don't read them. So maybe plug your socials out loud so people can follow you, interact with you. Yeah. Twitter is at Andrew Young, A-N-D-R-U-Y-E-U-N-G. My Instagram is at Andrew's Mixers. And my website is www.andrewsmixers.com. Awesome. Andrew, this has been an absolute pleasure. I'm so excited to get to see what you build over the next few years and hopefully develop a relationship with you and, and attend some of these events. Yeah. Thank you again for coming on the show. It has been just an absolute pleasure. And I think people are going to get so much out of this episode. Thanks for having me. Super fun. Great job running the pod. And I'm excited to see it when it goes live. Awesome. Thank you.